Good evening, everyone. Feel free to come down closer. Or maybe you need that space, because a lot <laughs> happened. Uh, my name is Marie Tolon. I'm the writer in residence here. And I've been for the past few years, and I was telling Kate, it's, it's such a privilege to be able to um, be in conversations with artists who come through the theater. And in that instance, with Kate, for the past few years, we've been talking about the work. So I um, always feel very privileged to see the work develop and, and have a chance to go into this in-depth conversation. Um, I'll start by asking two or three questions, and then I'd love to open the floor to questions that you may have. Um, and I'd love for the dancers to introduce themselves when they come. Um, maybe you would like to start. Yes, th this is Julian de Leon, who is my yes. um, our rehearsal director. And this is Mike Faba, our lighting designer. So Kate, I'd like to start um, with a question about the score. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned in past conversation that you like the movement to happen and the sound score to happen separately, and then maybe they meet at some point, yeah. uh, sometime at the very last minute. I'm wondering if that happened with Marksman, and also what directions or conversations uh, or direction you gave to the composer, mm -hmm. uh, Curtis MacDonald, if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, so this score was created by a um, Canadian jazz saxophonist, and almost everything that you've heard is created from the saxophone. Most of it. There's other instruments, but the bass is all saxophone. Um, his name is Curtis McDonald. He's based in Brooklyn, and this is our first collaboration. Um, I think it really, honestly, it really depends on the piece, how I deal with music. For instance, um, Brightland, which we'll bring back on ODC next year, I was, uh, that's based on old time Appalachian music, and uh, in that case, I was really following the script of the music because those are story songs, and the music was framing my material. But often when I'm developing new work, oh, let me introduce the dancer, sorry, they just shut up. Uh, Ryan Rulin Smith. Um, Thryn Saxon. This is my associate director and longtime dance member, Douglas Gillespie. And um, Kayla Farish. And Nicole Diaz. Bon Diaz. Um, so in this case, with Marksman, I, I often, when I'm developing new material, um, try and listen to the movement first, in a sense, and see what the movement can speak about. Um, intention-wise, musically, um, visual music, all the things that movement can offer. And then I start interacting with sound at some point, ideally with a collaborator who's challenging me and, and asking me to think differently about movement. Um, and in Curtis's case, we did a lot of what I would call getting to know each other by spitballing material, <laughs> like throwing it up against each other and sort of talking about what would happen to the movement material, how the music would get influenced, and trying to figure each other out through the mediums themselves. Um, it was a long, drawn-out collaboration, and I think Curtis was in the studio a lot with us, experimenting with sounds, both live and things that he would bring in and try out. And the dancers also have lots of opinions, and so, um, yeah. It was interesting developing this score, and I think in some ways it got very tied into the physicality of the work and the um, loosening and tightening nature of this material. Uh, so. And the kind of primitive aspects also mm -hmm. of the, both the movement and the sound score. Yes, although if Curtis were here, that bison sounds and those mating elks, and I don't know if you heard those things, and um, I loved those sounds, and Curtis is very resistant to them. Uh, so he would argue that I forced him to keep them in. <laughs> Power issues. Yeah, of course, always. Between sound and music, always. I mean, uh, music and dance. And um, 
We've also talked about the fact that Marksman is a revisit, kind of a, you went back to the trio unstruck and uh, kind of revisited. Well, and I finished that unstruck trio and felt like I hadn't quite achieved something that I needed to explore, so I developed it into a sextet, mm -hmm. basically. But it was a very concentrated 23-minute trio, and some of that material remains altered. Unstruck still remains as a trio, but it's very different than this piece. Much more, um, if you can believe it, harsher. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this piece is actually gentler in a way. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm curious, and you, you've revisited the works in the past. When, when do you have a sense that a, a work is complete, or a sense of completeness in the work? Never. Uh, I don't know. I mean, does any artist ever get really, you know, feel like, oh, you've finished it, or, um, or resolved something? I think. I don't know if other people feel this way who make art in the audience, but. I feel like art is a process of searching around in the dark, usually trying to solve things that are coming up psychologically for me or trying to solve things that I can't, you know, quite understand in the world mm -hmm. or resolve emotionally. And so I'm not arguing that it's therapeutic, not at all. I think one works very hard to try and find some cohesive communication, but, um, you know, it comes from a, a problem that I'm chewing on or gnawing on. So I'm not sure if it ever really resolves. And for an audience, I hope, you know, people can take it and continue to gnaw on it in a way. Um, a question maybe for the dancers. Um, I feel that as a dancer, you are constantly navigating this very porous line between the inside and the outside. You're really much in your body and I mean, there's much more to say, but and also very much aware of the space uh, around you and partner your partners. Um, I feel that this uh, line is even turned up in volume with Kate's work. That's the feeling that I have as a viewer. Like the intensity of listening, especially in your partnering work, is is really much heightened. Um, and for me, as a viewer, it kind of creates a sort of vortex. Mm. It kind of sucks me in because mm. there's this attention to detail. So I would like to hear from you if if that's a characteristic of the work that you're making in the studio with Kate, or if you could talk about that a little bit more. Yes, um, <laughs> to all of that. Uh, yeah, we. I, I think it was funny. Thrin and I, while we were backstage or just behind the curtain, um, we're talking about how. We were just in it tonight. We weren't. We didn't even realize that there was audience in for you know for part of it, which is the optimal condition. I think that everything else melts away, and everyone on the stage becomes more enlivened. Um, yeah, it's I. I often find when I first started working with Kate, we did so much partnering, and then <clears throat> excuse me, the second piece that we did or that I did was uh, Lean To, and I had a solo and. Uh, I had been partnering for so long that when I had the solo, I was like, "There's nobody else that I'm focusing on right now." You know, like it was, it was, it was difficult because I didn't have anyone to relate to. It was just me reckoning with my own dance, and that's something that I think is really um, indicative of Kate's work: is that you get so involved in the interpersonal relationships that we, you know, that we make inside of this. That it's you get pulled into a vortex of whatever this world is. Yeah, so um, we've been doing this work for about a year and a half. And I think for us over time, uh, diving back into actually letting the sensations be new every night has been one of the big tasks for the company. Um, so it's not so much knowing exactly what we're doing with those heightened specific moments, but allowing them to happen each night and let them be new and experience um, the sensation of somebody else doing it to you as opposed to knowing that it's about to be done to you. And that's... Uh, the ongoing challenge of doing it, but it's also very exciting and scary. <laughs> it's staying in the yeah. um, any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's a, a practice to step into the moment and really be aware of uh, 
you know, interactions with people especially, but uh, yeah, I think at the mindset of allowing your focus to broaden, definitely. Yeah, go for it, go for it. Um, I was just thinking about that recently, actually. You guys are gonna have to help me with the language, but um, uh, this amazing woman, Risa, who is working with us in the studio, was asking us to not know the end result, but live in each moment of it from the beginning through, even if it's a movement, movement where you know how this movement ends, you know the completion of it, and you're so, you can often get wrapped up in that end product. Achieving it, yeah, and I've, I've been thinking about that in terms of my relationship, actually, <laughs> and it's been a really profound shift mentally. I don't know how much I've put into practice, but that, yeah, that awareness of, like, not jumping to the end of it or assuming what you think is the finished product and then just going through it, so, yeah. I, I think the piece itself was trying to ask these questions about um, whether control, the, the willfulness that we bring and try and control events is actually effective or not. Whether it's um, possible to do it or whether it's actually entirely ineffectual and, we're, and we are basically shaped anyway, whether we realize it or not. So I think um, I've certainly been thinking about these questions. Uh, I'm not sure. I think human beings have such an urge to try and you know, have control. It's very, isn't that the great quest through time to let go? Yeah. And just adding on to that, I think it, that question, it shifts. Um, I think sometimes you have this incredible effort and things can happen and you can make them happen. And then other times it's just <laughs> bombarding you and it's kind of strange, but it also you stumble onto other things. But tonight I felt like, uh, yeah, I felt like it, at least for me tonight, I felt like it shifted more into effort and will, which was interesting, it, it, it changes. Um, and that's not to say one is bad or, or doesn't work, um, at least to me. I agree, yeah. There's, there's room for that change that happened in the moment. Do you have some basic vocabulary instructions like action, reaction that you began with as your choreographic direction for them? Because I felt a lot of action, reaction, both physical touch and just Choreographic, change, yes. Which led them to a whole series of reactions. Absolutely. I mean, the, the sort of domino effect that happens through the movement is, but I also think we did some really interesting early improvisational research and we found a language as we went. We would, you know, we research an improv. It's, you know, developing a dance is sort of like being in a laboratory. You know, you're trying to figure things out and then you attach language to it as though you could pin down meaning, right? So we, Again, an illusion, but anyway. So um, we started to name things like jelly, uh, sea jellying, and dry pointing, and we sort of got this language attached to particular energetic modes inside the material. And we could, and in a way, we could apply those energies to many different kinds of material, actually, and it would change its nature. So, um, what was your language then? What What are some of the languages <laughs> that we used? Uh, well, anchoring. Morphing, like Morphing. which feels like bug-like, yeah. but also molten, and like molten. or glacial. Yep. Um, fast talking. <laughs> There's a section called Boyance. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these, uh, all of these words are titles to way, uh, ways that sensations that we felt in the body, and it, I, we built a lot of them at a residency in um, Albany, what, almost two years ago. Yeah, uh, but it was a lot of research in the studio and a lot of um, Kate watching us work and say, oh, I, I trapped that, I want that. And we would give it a name or, um, like there's a section called uh, Gladiators, which is the, the big bison sound in the piece. And Glad ladies, yes. Glad ladies. Uh, but it, it just kind of took on a name and a mode. And so it's like shorthand for us to get back to that style of moving. Um, those moments in the studio are sort of like um, finding leads and then you go deeper into that research and try and figure out, for me, the challenge is then to figure out what meaning could that research hold? What can it offer, you know, in terms of communicative power, basically? Um, so throughout the piece it kind of seemed as if there was like a, an idea of escape and like trying to break old habits, kind mm -hmm. of, and the 
and just finding your way out and then kind of going back into the same mode. Yeah. And I saw that there were like a lot of repetitive movements like this mm -hmm. thing happening. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted you guys to maybe speak to the idea of repetition within the movements and the timing. Because mm -hmm. there was a lot of like moments of like very, very slow, 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 and then sped up really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Those are such good observations. Mm -hmm. I think there is something about getting stuck in the piece or stuck in habitual behavior mm -hmm. and, and living in it and sort of um, being stuck. <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot of that. And, and the, effort of trying to, the effort of trying to form or reform or move past, you know, the, the willfulness of that. I think I think you also were playing with repetition a lot in this yeah. piece. Like Kate doesn't normally, in my experience, doesn't normally go back to things and repeat them inside the piece as frequently. It's normally just like this is it done. This is it done, and she went back and repeated things and put this thing again facing a different direction or something like that. And I think she was trying to get away from some of the the things that were in her normal craft making and then just trying to to go well what if we do this and what if we do this and experimenting a little bit i was also very interested in trying to figure out choreographic looseness and wildness chaos on stage and things that were too the eye can't make sense of it and so in order to choreograph things like that and make it bearable i knew there needed to be language that people could hook right because otherwise like experimental jazz or something you're just like you know. <laughs> so I and I think that really good experimental forms have underlying girders, you know, structure in them. So I was thinking a little bit about how do I make this possible for someone to see at least fleeting ideas in there, even though it's so loose and it kind of doesn't make sense. And so a lot of the movement was housed in other dancers, like they made it and then transferred it to somebody else. So we really had to study one another and figure out how that thing was being moved or where it was being initiated from and all that kind of stuff. So it was very studied in that way of yeah. transferring the movement to one another. I think it's a very challenging dance for dancers because they have to mediate so much to hear each other, mediate self and autonomy. And, and normally my work really celebrates individuality and here they're all sort of forced to really come toward this cellular listening, which is you know, egoless in a way. Mm -hmm. I thought it interesting more in terms of being rebuffed and then being accepted. Mm -hmm. I must say the overall emotion that came to me was anger, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily believe that's a bad thing. Yeah. Because if you're going to keep resolving it, you have as dancers and we have as human beings the right to rethink it and think about yeah. the situation. Yeah. So I thought usually don't have such a strong reaction in terms of yeah. are they going to become more coherent. Mm -hmm. The fact that I found I didn't think they were in my mind didn't disturb me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's an interesting comment. Can you that? We, have, we couldn't hear. Couldn't hear. Um, do you want to say it louder? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> just summarize it. Basically, <laughs> I thought it was about time. being rebuffed and being accepted. But the overall impression I got was anger. Anger, 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 the overall uh, sentiment. Intention. <coughs> Intention. At first, I thought that that would be off-putting, but human nature is such that you get angry and you don't always mm. resolve. Mm. So I thought it was an interesting way to display it. Yes. And also to come back to um, the point that you made about repetition, um, there's this sense, at least for me as a viewer, with this. Um, this tension between um, holding and then letting go, and, and things get built and then they dissolve. So also, um, coming back to your point about being in the moment, and they create that sense of livelihood uh, and, and uh, something that is breathing and very much alive. Um, you had another question? Well, I just wanted to congratulate the light designer because mm -hmm. I was always very attracted to your center your side spot, <coughs> your linear design, mm -hmm. and it also helped me to see <laughs> and to focus, which <laughs> and, and do you want to talk a little bit more about the lighting? Yeah, well, thank you very much. And um, 
This piece has been really magnificent because we had um, many opportunities to work on the tech of it. And for anyone who's worked in um, the dance industry before, you might know that dance moves very, very fast on a production scale. And um, it's not unusual to get into a space at um, you know, 9 o'clock on a Tuesday and open 36 hours later on Wednesday. So oftentimes the time for conceptual work is very short um, with the equipment you have. And we had um, four opportunities to sort of continue to revise the design for this piece um, before we premiered at the Joyce Theater in New York. And this would be our fifth. So that's certainly very useful in um, being able to work in the space with time. and. Um, I think that, uh, going off the conversation before, in the lighting design, I have the sense that time feels very slippery in this piece. Um, things that maybe take two minutes feel very long, and things that feel very long can feel very short. And I, I try to kind of build on that building and collapsing within the design and limiting the space and opening it back up again. Um, and it was also nice being able to impose some strict geometry on certain parts, um, which can either work with or be oppositional to the movement that's happening on stage. I also think one very interesting aspect of Mike's design is that he were very he was very careful about when he would show form and when he would reveal more humanity. So where when do they turn into people? You can have access to their faces or their sweat, or when do they become sort of really formal? And uh, there's a yeah. I just have another question pertaining to the costume. So like you had the women's like a lot of the women dancers had their backs exposed. Yeah. And particularly with you, you had a lot of motion in your back and you saw it looked like you were trying to escape from out of your own body <laughs> like the bursting out of your ribs and articulation through your spine. Uh, why did you choose to highlight the backs of the women and like and why cover the men in that regard? Hmm. That's a, I wish my costume designer was here to answer that question because it really was a collaboration. But um, I think, you know, in the original trio, uh, Nicole is part of the original trio, and Ryan and Julian, and we had three different costumes in the original trio, so the men were, there were parts of their bodies that were more revealed, um, but Nicole's back became very important in the choreography, and when we transferred it to a sextet, I think that that idea of the back became sort of this powerful motif. Now, why did the men not have it? I do feel the pieces relatively genderless, except for the costumes. So that's an interesting, what you're bringing up is very interesting. Um, I think that there's something about the women in this piece that is more important than the men. In the original trio, Kate kept trying to squish me and form me, and <laughs> and just like, what can we do with Nicole? Um, and it got to the point, like ends of rehearsals, you know, we were sweating, we were taking shirts off, and like, and I think there was a point in which I, I just had, you know, like a small bra on, and you know, we were running the piece, and my shirt was soaking, so I didn't put it back on, and she's like, ooh, I like that. I can see what's happening now. And, and so that just became its own thing. And then, and then I just kept having to like wear shirts that didn't have a back. And then, and then we just like progressively started making that its own character so that you could see that it was way more than, than me as a human being. It was a form. Um, and I think the anger that you were speaking of earlier, um, I, don't, I don't interpret that as human anger. Kate talked a lot about, uh, she sat us down, she's like, you know when you're watching like a slow-mo video of a seedling coming out of the ground and it almost has to have like violence or aggression to go and come out of the ground and then, it, and then you're watching it form in slow motion? She's like, I want to get that violence, that like, that, that like, <laughs> that like energy that uh, a new life form needs to like assert itself in the world and then figure itself out. And then how can it figure itself out on its own and then up against other people? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, a lot of questions, a lot of experiments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, I'm curious whether I feel like the piece operated at lots of different scales. Like there was the physical language mm -hmm. in the bodies, and then there was the kind of like compositional forms. Um, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it would be possible for you to pinpoint times at which those pieces came together in the process, or if they mm. all coexisted from the beginning, or... That's a really interesting question. Um, that's a very challenging question, because it asks me to make sense of a process. Um, you know, Clifford Ross came into this process relatively late, and it was helpful to have this. This is a tough space to see this piece, I will say, because it really should be seen from very far away, I think. The scale of it is meant to be at a distance, because these should be feel very monumental for this piece, like a macro idea. And the dancers, in a way, when we light it on larger stages, they feel very small relative to these totems, which is helpful for the piece, this idea about how relevant we are, you know. Um, where, hmm. <clears throat> Like, in other words, big scale versus tiny scale. Is that what you're thinking about? The, the small ideas. One of my favorite moments in this entire piece is when Kayla first comes on and faces Thryn. I love this moment for some reason. I don't know why. And then she does these weird things about whether she's inside of Thryn's structure or whether, and whether she's not. And there's something about the mechanics of that that I think I find them totally fascinating both um, compositionally, physically, and then also what they imply about power and hierarchy and control. Uh, so finding little kind of crystalline moments like that that are just speaking in some strange way. I wanted to find lots of moments where interactions happen that are hard to pin down, but clearly they're affecting people and shaping them. People or organisms. <laughs> um, and then the big stuff. I wanted to see how far I could push myself to absorb large energetic shifts in space through many bodies. You know, kind of very, the way when you, when you look at nature, sometimes it's overwhelming to make sense of it, you know, um, often and recently. <laughs> I'll take maybe one last question. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's an interesting comment. And then also sometimes they do this weird buzzing around and then they decide to come and collect, like the way, I suppose, corpuscles do or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think Curtis caught very beautifully, because his music doesn't necessarily sound much like this, actually. So he caught kind of the way Meredith Monk is so amazing about catching physicality inside of sound. And there's some of that that I think is really strange and exciting in the way he especially the finger, the way he's doing that strange fingering, and so much circular breathing in his playing in here, too. You can hear it, you know. Anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for sticking around. <laughs>